Welcome to Pop Psych 101, where we, licensed therapist Ryan Engelstad and licensed psychologist Dr. Haley Roberts, break down and analyze how mental health is represented in movies, shows, books, and across the pop culture and social media landscape. We will determine what lines up with real life and what is just pop culture fantasy. This is Pop Psych 101. Welcome back to Pop Psych 101. I am licensed therapist Ryan Engelstad, here as always with my co-host, Dr. Haley Roberts. Hello, hello. Hello, Haley, and I would be remiss if I also didn't introduce our guest, who we are very excited to have with us on the podcast today. So we don't do guests very often, but we were excited with this opportunity because this is a movie, frankly, that I really enjoy and was looking forward to talking about. So we have an expert joining us. So I want to introduce Debbie Carroll. Debbie, thank you so much for joining us. Um, You are from OnSite. So I'll let you tell us a little bit about OnSite and and kind of how we got here. And then we'll we'll kind of jump into the episode. But thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you two so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Just briefly, OnSite has been an international leader in the emotional health space for over 40 years. OnSite believes that We must be deeply connected to who we are first in order to be deeply connected to others. And our vision is an emotionally well world, humanity reconnected. So OnSite um, offers a variety of different programs from intensives where an individual or couple works one-on-one with a therapist for a period of time. There are also a variety of different workshops. There's a living centered workshop, um, a healing trauma workshop. In addition to a residential facility that focuses specifically on trauma. So I'm fairly new to OnSite. I've been with OnSite for about six months. And my role, I oversee our new entertainment division and entertainment and specialized services division, which encompasses public facing individuals who may have a difficult time finding the support that they need due to their Mm -hmm. occupations. I can say, speak for myself, I can walk into my therapist's office and nobody's going to point me out and say, oh my goodness, so-and-so, was, Debbie Carroll was getting, I saw her therapist today, yet <laughs> so many others in that space can't just walk into a therapist's office. So OnSite has been serving that population for decades yet and really focusing a, a spotlight and, and a division specifically on concierge-based services that can meet that client where they are and we can bring those services to them. Great. So that's a little bit about OnSite in a nutshell. And is OnSite available nationwide? It is available nationwide. People travel from all over, actually, the world to come to OnSite. Yet there are two facilities at the moment, two physical locations, one in Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee, located on about 250 acres with um, horses and pigs and and all sorts of healing animals. And it's a beautiful facility and they also believe specifically on healing hospitality. So a lot of food, farm to table type of culinary experiences to beautiful cabins with with fireplaces. And they have a another facility in California near San Diego that has that same type of, of environment as well. Wonderful. Fantastic. And, and you uh, you said you just recently joined OnSite, but prior to that, you were also sort of working in the, the entertainment industry in a, in a way as well. Is that right? I was. I worked for Music Cares for over almost 24 years, and I oversaw our programs and services nationwide. And Music Cares is a charitable arm of the Recording Academy, best known for the Grammy Awards. And we provided emergency financial assistance to music people in times of need. And often uh, behavioral and emotional health, in addition to addiction services, were accounted for a large portion of what we did annually to help support folks. Wonderful. Fantastic. So you have an intimate knowledge of sort of what it's like to be in those industries, but also need that sort of specialized help, right? People who understand the the unique challenges that, as you said, public facing individuals can sometimes experience, which brings us to what we're talking about today, which is a movie. I can't believe it's 22 years old, but it is almost famous. Ooh. So a, a movie that obviously 
in in great detail kind of deals with some of the unique challenges of people both in and around um, in this case the music industry so before we get into almost famous you know we debbie like to kind of do just like a setup question to kind of get us in the mindset of talking about these topics so so haley i'll throw it to you first you know do you have uh, earliest sort of music or concert memories or experiences that jump out because watching this movie with for me, these look like children, partially because there are a lot of actors and actresses I recognize from today. What a and, cast, But this right? movie is 22 years old. Yeah. Wow. So so what comes to mind for you when you think like early music experiences? Yeah. My first concert is was The Beach Boys, which nice. is an incredible first concert. I know, right? <laughs> and yeah, that one I went to with my parents, but I loved The Beach Boys growing up. That was like one of my favorites. Uh, the first concert that I went to by myself, I was, I think, a freshman in high school, was Jack Johnson. Um, and that was a really fun nice. concert, too. Yeah, it was a good time. <laughs> my brother waited until I had left for the concert to tell my mom that there would probably be a lot of illicit drugs there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my mom geez. was like, I trust my daughter. I trust my daughter. <laughs> oh, so, so better than William's mom is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean. That's something I think we can talk about because William's mom we sure will. actually yes. trusts him quite a lot. Like she That's lets true. him go. That's true. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, thankful for that older brother choosing when he shared the information. But yeah, so that was my first concert ever and then my first concert by myself. Nice. Yeah. And, and Debbie, what about you? I mean, I, I imagine you have early music experiences as well that maybe brought you towards that industry. Yes. I will say my first concert, we were living in Wyoming at the time. My parents, we moved there when I was 11. So it was the Doobie Brothers in Idaho Falls, Idaho with my mom. Nice. So, <laughs> yes. So, and I think, Haley, my first concert alone, and I may be mistaken, but I think it was the police synchronicity tour in Salt Lake City, Utah. So oh, what a good one. It was a good one. Yours were great too. And I, I just remember I was thinking and talking to somebody about this today because of this film, but that getting an album and studying the liner notes and really looking yeah. at who the musicians were and spending hours playing the music over and over again while looking at the pictures. And mm -hmm. that was such an amazing experience that is that people don't get that today unless they're no. real music fans and you know buy the LPs again. But it was a different world back then. I'm dating myself a little bit, but. <laughs> but I think even when it was like moved on to CDs and things like that, that would also come with the lyrics and everything like in the little booklet. And I often wonder, I'm obsessed with the lyrics of songs. And sometimes teens today, I feel like just kind of generally like the music. And I mm. wonder sometimes if it's because they have to like actively seek out the lyrics. But now with things like Apple Music and Spotify naturally showing the lyrics while the songs play. I wonder if that's going to change things too. So what about you, Ryan? Yeah, it's a great question. No, I definitely cut out lyrics from the liners of CD packages and like, <laughs> I don't know, pasted them on my school folders and, and things like that. Uh, I have very intense memories of like, we had a little CD shop around the corner from my house in like a small town in New Jersey. And I, you know, just like, Penny Lane says, go into the record store. You know, it wasn't a record store. It was a CD store, but it was the same kind of feel of like, mm -hmm. this is where I can find cool stuff I haven't heard anywhere else. Yeah. But my earliest music experiences with my parents was probably Bruce Springsteen, who they've oh, seen, so wow. I don't know, whom, how many times. I, c I couldn't even begin to guess. Um, I have extended family that have met him just randomly on the boardwalk. So that kind of tells you you know, where I'm coming from, but, <laughs> but alone, well, you know, obviously it was like, you know, mom dropped me off and probably didn't go too far, but technically alone was a uh, warped tour uh -huh. in Asbury park. Yeah. And I was probably 16, 15, 16, you know, so that's a lot of firsts that's first yeah, moshing and, and crowd surfing and all those things. So and I ironically just saw one of the bands I saw at that first concert earlier this summer. So Fun. 20 years later, got to see the same band from my first uh, big concert series. So full circle. <laughs> yeah. 
Hyman started the Warp Tour back in the day. So yeah. no, well, I love that. He's going to love that story. So I can't wait to share that with him as well. That's fun. Yeah, well, those those bands are, are still doing well. You know, if they pop up, uh, you know, a big crowd follows. So yeah. it made, made me feel good that I didn't, I didn't feel too old, you know, with the band from 20 years ago. It felt like we were all kind of like in that same in that same headspace. So definitely a cool experience. And you know, all those memories coming back. I think that's that's a good note for us to take a quick break and dive into the drama that is Almost Famous. So we will be right back after this break. Hey everyone, Ryan here. No ad this week, but a quick request. We would love to know where you follow us. So if you wouldn't mind taking 10 seconds while you're listening to today's episode, reach out to us on your social media of choice. Say hi, say what's up, request an episode topic. We would love to hear from you. And now back to the episode. Pop Psych 101 discusses mental health as it is portrayed in pop culture media. And because of this, we often cover sensitive topics that can be triggering for some listeners. We also delve into the characters and plots of these stories, and therefore, spoilers abound. So please, use your discretion as you listen to the rest of the episode. Almost Famous is a 2000 American comedy drama film written and directed by Cameron Crowe. It tells the story of a teenage journalist writing for Rolling Stone magazine in the early 1970s, his touring with the fictitious rock band Stillwater, and his efforts to get his first cover story published. The film is semi-autobiographical, as Crowe himself was a teenage writer for, for Rolling Stone, so we have to keep that in mind as we're sort of you know, breaking down the accuracy of this, because some of it, as far as we are know, is based on Cameron Crowe's real life experience. But obviously, every, you know, names are changed and the band is fictitious. So we really get to kind of dive in deep with um, the sort of representation that we get of not just uh, musicians in general, but this is a very specific time, as Lester Bangs would say, um, in rock, you know, that rock is dead, at least as far as Lester is concerned. But, you know, Debbie, I wanted to start with you because the sort of initial scene that we get to meet all of these main characters is in William's sort of first opportunity to write an article for Cream magazine. And he almost accidentally runs into Stillwater because they're running late for their gig. And then he gets to meet this band and all of a sudden it's he joins the family. Right. Um, and you said yourself that, you know, bands in many cases are like a family. So when we're introduced to this family that is Stillwater and the sort of people around the band, too, from Penny Lane to the manager to obviously William joins as well. You know, I'm curious what your initial impression is of the band in particular. And we can kind of go through the individuals as we go. But, you know, when you see them running late, you know, for their gig, what's your first impression of them, you know, as as a group, as a, as a cohesive group? It, it, to me, it seemed like they were more of a, a band that was just starting out yet gaining some momentum. Yeah. Just, and, and yes, running late and then William strategically or, or was a fan, I, you know, I don't know which, but that he began calling them my name and mm -hmm. calling out some of their music. And then suddenly yep. like, ah, oh, okay, you're in, come on in. And then the, the security guy, that, that was funny. <laughs> And then yeah. he said, well, wait, he's not on the list. And they're like, who, you know, who, um, it just yeah. pushed his way through. Yeah, sure. yeah. So there seemed to be a lot of energy. They seemed excited about what they were doing. And he, it, to me, he just wanted to get that story too. But then for suddenly sure. engrossed in that, in that community and that, and in that road family for sure. Yeah. Do you find that in that stage of a band's growth, having somebody like William be able to call th them by name and speak specifics about their songs and the music is something that plays a role in, in their growing identity at that stage for bands? I think that's important regardless of their stage in their careers. It's mm -hmm. it, they're being seen, mm -hmm. their art and their talents are being recognized. You know, musicians, put their heart and soul into their music. And I hear this time and time again, that 
it's not it's not an occupation for them it's a it's something they have to do it's just built within them and so uh, for someone like myself i can can cut work off if i need to and and you know just be me and and not but yet musicians it's all about who they are internally um and so they're really their vulnerability too is in putting their craft out there for the masses to then critique. And so I think being seen and heard and valued is universal regardless of professions, but particularly for somebody who's out there day in and day out and really you know, doing their best to make a career in a, a really unique, difficult profession, that those things are important. It matters. Yeah. Yeah. I think I mean, Ryan and I so frequently, the phrase that comes up in so many of our episodes is people just want to be seen. Um, And so you saying that I think is huge, but I also like what you've shared is that these performers, their personal experiences, their emotions, the way that they live is the way that they present themselves to the world. It's the way they make their money. It's so when people buy their records, they're buying them in a way, you know, whereas like for Mm. me, if somebody likes me as a therapist, it doesn't necessarily mean anything to me as a person outside of that. Or if somebody meets me in one situation, I get to like kind of control what I share with them and what they know about me and what they don't know about me. And when you're public facing, A, oftentimes what you're performing is yourself, but then also you don't always have control over what people know about you because people are so willing to write stories about you for a magazine, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, amazing. right, and, and in this day and time, social media, I mean, something can mm-hmm. be done so quickly that, you know, and during that time when the movie was created and also the time period that, that they were living in, that wasn't the case, but yet you still saw the challenges that they faced regardless of that. Yeah. So you add social media on top of that, and it's just created a, a opportunity to add more angst and, and challenges for for creatives. And yeah. I'll say that that creatives have a three times higher propensity to suffer from some type of emotional health issue. And that's because I mean we could spend all day talking about why. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yet, given that, and then given what they face every day, that it's even more important to help support them with emotional health and and ensuring that they're healthy and have the tools that they need to have in place in order to embark upon this crazy career that they've chosen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Debbie, even in in your introduction, you talked about helping people connect to themselves first, Mm -hmm. right, before they have to connect with others. And, you know, I have to imagine being a, a member of a band or being on the sort of outside looking into the band, it's a lot of we might even call like enmeshed boundaries or the or more non-existent boundaries right everyone's wanting not just to be seen but wanting to be seen a certain way i'm the front man i'm a golden god i'm you know my job is to get that one guy off as uh, as jeff says at one point like they they want to be seen but they also want to be seen as something specific something with value something you know that that goes beyond just I'm in a band. So when William, you know, is complimenting them and showing them how how much he knows and he says Russell is incendiary, it's like, oh, this kid gets it. Yeah, you're in with us. You know, keep saying that stuff and you can kind of come along with us as long as you want. It's like having that one true fan, you know, it's like, yeah, that feels great. This this is what um not that they're in it to be complimented, right? But they're in it to to do something to generate that reaction, if that makes sense. Absolutely. That sort of excitement. Yeah. Yes. And that value. And and with band members too, I'll say that that often, you know, if if you're not the front person or the lead singer and it's not a, a cohesive band, you know, there's some some fear of being let go if you're not if you're not cutting the mustard and not performing in the way that that people assume that you should. So there's always I, I hear and I read from artists as well, always this inner critic that, am I enough? I'm not the best drummer, but am I enough for this band? And so, yeah, that recognition from even someone like William, who was 15. Yeah. Important. It's important. Yeah. 
Well, and even Jeff's response in that moment was he said, I'm incendiary too, which yes. at the time was funny. But then as the movie goes along, you realize, oh, he truly feels like, hey, also notice that I'm here. Yeah. Um, it's not just Russell, you know, and then with the merch and the way things are being portrayed to the world, the who's the incendiary one, who's the one that's the lead, um, that kind of stuff does pop up through the movie as, you know, Jeff is like, hey, I'm here too. Yeah. Right. And that certainly pops up in bands that can pop up in families. So yeah. Yeah. when people begin feeling insecure too, that can even, you know, you can heighten that sense of, well, wait a minute, I'm as important or I'm doing more than this person's doing. And so it can become really challenging for bands when there is some, conflict how do you you know how do you deal with that and get in there and really talk about it so we saw it many times in the movie where they didn't they didn't do that well they certainly didn't communicate well and so that's another thing that we do do at on site we bring bands together and have family therapy which is oh, so fun beautiful and fun to see it's like team building we all yeah have. absolutely I think when you invest in something like that, it can only just help sustain your career even longer and mm -hmm. build trust and, and respect for your, for your band members too, particularly when there's conflict. Yeah. Well, and also what's so different for a band like Stillwater is, you know, if it's a team at work or team that like they get to come together to do the teamwork, but then they all get to go home. That's like one set of yeah. experiences for this team, right? For this band, they are all together all the time. And that conflict, you need to get through it quickly or as, as they often do in this is or shove it down and just don't address it in order to be able to move forward so closely together all the time. But then we like we see the way that it's done in this group is not ideal because then it pops up kind of in problematic ways or you know on a plane when they all think they're gonna die and then it comes out like full speed yeah so I definitely I think the idea of having family therapy for bands is unique in that they don't really get their independence but they all are independent people mm -hmm. yeah so cool. yeah and obviously we're, we're meeting Stillwater through the eyes of one young very young William Miller, 15 years old, uh, despite what he would probably tell anybody else other than Penny Lane. And, you know, he's obviously a very interesting character in his own right. So Haley, is, as we're doing first impressions, you know, obviously we meet William as a much younger child, sort of seeing his older sister mm -hmm. fly the coop and, and go off on her own at the age of 18. But as a kid who skipped a grade and a half, maybe two grades, um, to be thrust into this world. You know, I wonder what you're seeing from him as he goes from this sort of quiet, conservative life, obviously with his mom, where she's trying to shelter him from a lot of these things that she perceives as, as dangerous or inappropriate for, for him, some of which she's probably right on, the po on point with that. What's your first impression of William as we're meeting him and seeing him kind of have some of these early on experiences? Yeah, I think the very curious thing about William when we first meet him is he's, I already used the word curious, but that's because it was on my mind. He's a very curious kid. So when you messaged me and you're like, oh, a theme I want to talk about is rebellion. And I kind of giggled because I was like, William at no point is rebellious. Mm. Like he makes a lot of choices that some parents would identify as a rebellious choice, but William is not a rebellious child. He is curious and he's just like this just makes sense for the next step of this his older sister is very rebellious right like she's mm -hmm. like i'm gonna get out of here i'm listening to this music because you don't like it and i want to learn it and da 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 yeah whereas even william when he gets the records from his sister he seems to just not like look through them in like a like hide this from mom kind of a way mm -hmm. but like a oh look at this record even in the beginning when the mom puts down anita's record like on the counter he just picks it up there in front of his mom. Like, look, I'm looking at it. Mm -hmm. And I also think that his mom is a huge role of how he is the way that he is and who he is. And I think it's pretty easy in this movie to look at her and see her as this like strict mom. But I don't know that she is because she gives him 
so much freedom and she trusts him an awful lot. And oftentimes strict parenting comes with kind of a lack of trust a little bit because you mm, you sure. are so afraid for your your child in this world and their ability to take care of themselves that you place so many rules around them to try to protect them from that. And she has a lot of rules, but she allows him to like go to the place that where those rules could be broken and she trusts that he won't. And I think like when she sends him off to the Black Sabbath Stillwater concert, when she yells out the car, like, don't do drugs. I thought that was like a really good representation of I'm sending you into the place where this could be possible. And I'm really nervous that I could be putting you in a tough position, but I trust you and do your best and I love you. And even as he like continues to kind of blow her off throughout the movie, she gets upset, but she also still kind of trusts him. And when all the people are like, your son is so wonderful. She's like, no, I know. Like he's, he's a wonderful kid. Like that's not what she's worried about. Yeah. 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 And I think that that's, you can't look at William without looking at his mom. But this mm-hmm. thing about like, he doesn't know his age and he's like with kid, he's in school with people who are so much older than him. He's got a lot of identity stuff where he doesn't fit in. And, and that happens a lot with age gaps in school. It also happens a lot, I think, for kids who don't know about their history or kind of find out that parents may not have been telling them everything. And we see that when he starts being included by Stillwater. He finally has found a place where he belongs. And it's ironic because it's kind of the place where he super doesn't belong because of who he is and what he's doing. But it's that thing that we talked about earlier of like he feels seen by these people and potentially for the first time outside of his mother and probably his sister. I wondered a little bit about the mom in that we didn't find out till later that the dad died from a heart attack. But as a mother myself, I was thinking, gosh, she lost her husband and she lost her daughter. Mm -hmm. And so therefore allowing a little bit more freedom, what other choice did she, I mean, she had lots of choices, but to let him go in order for him to come back and the fear that she didn't, he wouldn't come back. What a brave mom. Yes. Yes. And I mean, she was, fearful all along the way. I mean, the phone calls were, were comical yet. Yeah. I mean, it went on and on and on. At some point I, as a mom, I would have been gotten on a plane and gone and picked him. Yeah, up. I know. Yes. But yeah. So he was a good kid and he wanted to be cool. I mean, that was, yeah. you know, his sister said, just be cool or something. I think it was good. Yeah. From his sister. So well, and it's he funny, certainly... if he had called like he had promised, she wouldn't have been frantically calling him. Like if he had just stuck to that agreement, she would have been like, okay, great. Because she was so good at being like, go do what you need to do. Yeah. And that's what I think is so wonderful about her as a character is they make her come across as though she's like this frantic, chaotic, overbearing mother. But as a matter of fact, she's not. Like she mm-hmm. gives him so much freedom and independence, which I think is... And trust. And I think that's lovely. And he's a good kid because of it. Yeah. Yeah. What did she say to her classroom? My, my kid's been kidnapped, kidnapped by, by, rock stars. by rock stars. Yeah. yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. It's so funny. My kid has been kidnapped by rock stars. As, as, and then the girl as took happens. notes. It happens. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, well, Haley, and I know you and I have talked about sort of working with with families and and parents in particular, and that's why I, I brought up the sort of theme of rebellion because it's not so much the kid, uh, the kids being rebellious or not, but sort of the parents' perception of my kid is following along with my boundaries or rules or expectations, or my kid is not, and that means basically like our relationship is not what I thought it was, or I'm losing my kid or things like that. And we, I've certainly worked with a lot of parents that might get perceived the way that William's mom does early on, right? Sort of overbearing, overprotective, won't let my kid do anything. And that perception is often coming from the kid, much like uh, William's sister, where it's like, my mom won't even let me listen to these records and it's poetry. And it's like, she just doesn't understand. And meanwhile, well, certainly today, you know, I, you know, I would say, even though as William's mom says, you know, you're 18, so I can't stop you. You know, I would say a lot of that stuff is, you know, true today as well. You know, you have a lot of kids either wanting to go out and do things on their own 
or the opposite, right? Sort of being stuck, um, maybe wanting to be out on their own, but having to be still under mom and dad's roof, mm -hmm. but wanting to live their own lives or, or go out and do things. So, you know, that sort of rebellious opportunity and choice, you know, that kids make is such an interesting, almost like developmental process that we see happen with William, right? Where he's not trying to, you know, as the movie shows more some of the more salacious sides of, of the of the experience, right? He's not going out to lose his virginity. He's not going out to do drugs. He genuinely wants to be a part of this music scene, but he falls into some of those paths. And, you know, Debbie, this is where I'm sort of curious for you, right? Because there are both uh, certainly musicians, uh, entertainers, as well as people within that world that get exposed to a lot of stuff at a very young age, you know, and I'm curious, you know, when you see, even using William as an example, sort of starting to get exposed to more and more, you know, maybe where your concerns start to come in. And obviously, you know, we see William handle it relatively well. Obviously, he comes back to mom's house by the end looking pretty haggard, but there's a lot of reasons for that. <laughs> yeah, there are. Certainly, there's a lot that can go with that lifestyle. Yeah. I'll say after you know, working directly with music people for a, a couple decades, a lot is changing too and shifting. Of course, of so, course. Yeah. Thankfully, their entire tours that are clean and their yeah. you know, the lifestyle is different. They're focusing more on things that they can do to, to help support their emotional health, you know, yeah. sleep, catering's changing. So there's a lot out there that is changing, mm -hmm. uh, but there's still that perception, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I hate to, you know, that's, that goes so far back that that's part of the gig. Sure. Um, yet also when a band or band members go too far down the road, you know, really it's up to those around them to help pull them back and to really speak the truth and say, wait a minute, you're going to, you're risking your whole career if you continue down this path. You know, for somebody like William, who was just around it, I mean, the, the band-aids as they called yeah, it. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's so, we could talk about that all night long too. For sure. Like yeah. What causes somebody to lose their sense of self and all that mm -hmm. is important to them to follow somebody who's famous in that way. That's always intrigued me a little bit. And obviously it's something that's missing within themselves to want to even be a part of that. But that I, I kind of cringed every time I saw those, the groupies or uh, that were hanging out backstage, but it happens all the time. You're like, Oh, sure. Where's your mom? <laughs> Where's your dad? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, and for William, he stayed grounded for the most part. I mean, at one point he even flipped off William. I mean, Russell from you know, behind the door and broke down in tears. And that yeah. I thought was a very pivotal moment too. And then yeah. he was like, okay, I'm done. I've had it, but I need to get this interview. I just want to get this and, and leave. Mm -hmm. But that was my perception of that. Yeah. I think that I do think it's wonderful that the, the industry is changing because we are so much more aware of addiction and mental health and things like that. And, but what I'm thinking like in terms of William and again, he's not the main person. He just finds himself in it, but a lot of performers are young when they're performing mm -hmm. like in their teens. Right. I'm thinking also like TikTok stars and things mm -hmm. like that, where at such a young age, they are, both thrust into adult-like independence while also at the same time not being allowed to have any independence. And rebellion isn't really allowed in the same way because like this is their job. And so if they want to keep doing it, they have to follow the rules. And, and mm. I wonder if you have any thoughts about kind of like that – stage that William is in, but if he was actually the front runner of all mm. of this rather than just the person observing. Right. I mean, there's so many artists that have spoken to that too. You know, I'm thinking of Leanne Rimes who started so, so young mm. and Taylor Swift started so young yet Taylor in particular had a, had a family that was very grounding mm. and was right there with her yet 
you know, what are they, your brain's not fully developed till you're 25. So, um, and I think back about, you know, all the choices I certainly made as a teenager and young adult and, and trying to live in that world mm -hmm. and be successful when you're just so young and vulnerable. And that would also be another opportunity for folks to really get some support. I, I'm such a huge proponent for preventative care. So if when, uh, when you sign an artist and you've got the, the media training and the wardrobe, the glam and all of the promotion and stuff, add a, add a line item in the budget for um, emotional health support because Yay. they're going to need it at some point. Yeah. Yes. yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> I mean, even just going through that orientation has to be stressful, right? Like all the yes. requirements of the media yes. training and all of that. Yeah, a transition like that from the get go is going to need support. And, you know, as a career starts to take off, really staying grounded in who they are and what they're all about, if they have the tools that they, they need to, to sustain their career versus turning to addictions or turning to you know, unhealthy lifestyle behaviors and then losing their sense of self. I mean, I've seen artists that have, have are really struggling with who, who am I, mm -hmm. you know, and really that should be something that, that we should all be able to define very clearly and separate from, yeah. you know, I'm so-and-so and I'm a, I'm a musician, mm -hmm. which, and I think, you know, I don't think, I don't think the music industry is unique in that realm either. Just that I, I do know that, lots and lots of people struggle with that, that who am I outside of my profession? That is one thing at Onsite that when people come to workshops, we don't, we ask them not to disclose what mm. they do professionally. Oh, sure. Hmm. So people are on an even playing field, but yeah, that support is so important because the wheels will fall off at some point and knowing where to turn and how to handle that and how to maneuver that is key to longevity and career sustainability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that separation sounds really important. I'm thinking in particular, uh, William asks Russell, like, do you have to be depressed to write a depressing song? Do you have to be sad to write a sad song? You know, and, and watching that scene brought to mind for me this sort of separation that you're talking about in that for people who perform very intense emotional things, obviously that is, you know, channeling your emotions in one way. But then, like, and that's the sort of performative aspect of me being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But then there's this whole other experience of vulnerability that either we don't see, and that's a good, healthy boundary, or, you know, I'm thinking especially of, you know, people in social media and streamers and things like this, where either that's a choice that they feel like they have to make, or that's sort of part of their brand is I just tell you everything about me and my family, and, and I'm just completely open, and you get to know every single part of my life. And there are some downsides with, I, I think, not having those boundaries, not having that separation to, to help yourself, you know, have, let's say, a performer identity and a, a private, I take care of myself identity, and I don't have to tell people about this part of my life. Right. And that is such a healthy boundary, because we all have private parts that, you know, maybe we choose to share with our best friend or our spouse or whomever, or a therapist, but yet... To have that broadcasted to the world is, you know, leaves people very, very raw and exposed. And, you know, I have heard artists, even of late, top level artists say recently that his manager said to him after a breakup, oh, good, that means you're going to be writing greater, you know, songs, which is just wrong. Oh, mm -hmm. no. And that's the assumption you have to mine your personal life for content. Yes. Is wrong. And also like, thank yeah. goodness you're feeling sad. It's going to make me money. <laughs> exactly. Right. And that's yeah. you know, the messages from people that are on payroll too. It's like, yeah. You know, what is your best friend saying to you about this? Or what is your, mm. you know, your family mm. members saying to you about this? Those, those trusted people that you know will tell you the honest truth regardless. Those people are so important. Sometimes artists can lose those folks in their lives as well because they're surrounded by everybody who is who they're supporting right on the payroll like you said yeah right yeah. yeah yeah i think there's such a fine line between being seen and being watched mm. um you mm -hmm. know and and that thing that you were talking about of wanting a life that is your own and if you're just constantly being watched it's so hard to 
have that space. You know, you can go to your therapist's office and nobody's going to be like, oh, look, there's Debbie at her therapist. But if you are somebody in the news, people are going to say that and, and you don't get any moment that's your own. Right. Yeah. And the, and I'll just say briefly, this wasn't a part of the show at all because it wasn't around them, but the cancel culture too. In the, oh, sure. You know, I, it just makes me cringe. Somebody stumbles and we all stumble mm -hmm. and yet they're immediately discarded. And a, a dear friend of mine said to me recently, none of us should be judged by our worst day. We should always be judged by so many other things in the worst day of our lives. Mm -hmm. So there's that risk too, which is huge. And great. Um, well, yeah, I mean, if, well. if, if the golden God scene happened in today's world, that would have been streamed live or uh -huh. pictures all over social media uh -huh. and he would have been canceled or like, you know, the consequences of that would have been much worse than, you know, he got high on acid and got plopped back on the tour bus and no one was the wiser basically. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, even with that, and may, I may have taken this wrong. So, but when the crowd was yelling jump, I thought, what? You know, why is anyone yes. there helping this guy? But instead they're encouraging him to jump. And I was like, oh, that just makes it, it, I feel like that dynamic too is, is very much a part of our culture too. The crowd mentality in a very negative slant. Mm -hmm. And I think when you get to, that level of being known without actually being known, people forget that you're a person, right? Yes. So then it's like, ooh, it'd be funny to see this guy jump from the roof into the pool rather than being like, this is a human person and that is dangerous, yes. which is William's the only one who's saying that. And that's because William has had the opportunity to get to know him and remember that he's a person. And, and I think that that shows up today an awful lot because of mm. social media. We we're able to say that this one tweet is this person and rather than thinking that they're a whole person. And one thing that I've always thought about cancel culture is we need to see, has this person grown? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it was Kevin Hart was fired from hosting something because of a tweet from like a decade before. And if you looked in between, he had never repeated that type of language and and it had improved his language as a matter of fact and i think that that's really important to look at as well is is somebody willing to take responsibility and grow and learn because if we don't give people those opportunities then none of us are ever going to get better and the world's never going to change so i think that that's a really wonderful way for us to hold people responsible without immediately writing them off agreed yeah, I love that. And we all have periods of growth in our lives that are very, mm -hmm. very painful. And some have to deal with that very publicly. Yeah. And right. Have they grown? And are they right? What are they doing to help shift the narrative? Or mm -hmm. I have to say, I say stupid things almost every single day. So <laughs> those that are out in the public and just say something that's just wrong, it's mm -hmm. like, let's give them a little grace. Yeah. Let's cut them yes, off. Yes, yes. So. Yeah, and some of the most painful sort of interactions we see in the movie are in these sorts of pseudo relationships that are built and then crumbling and built and then competing for one another's attention. And, you know, I wanted to, to sort of take a, a moment to acknowledge some of that awkwardness, some of that tension that gets built as a result of these pseudo relationships, right? So we, we talked about the sort of family nature of the band, but we also have Russell and William, we have Russell and Penny Lane, we have William and Penny Lane. And, and, you know, when people are in different ways, sort of trying to build relationships in this environment that we sort of acknowledged is, it's not artificial, because obviously, it's really happening, but it's not uh, real in the sense of like, this is our normal lives, you know, this is what our everyday lives are like. So Debbie, I'm sure you have some some experience or perspective on this to sort of how do people and not necessarily within the band, but just sort of maintain relationships, whether it's with their family, with their friends, while going through such an intense experience like a tour or like, a you know, a, such a performative uh, lifestyle like that. Well, and thankfully, that's where technology comes into play in a positive way. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. people are so, we're, we're so much, you know, text messaging and, and connecting by phone and FaceTime, et cetera, allows for 
while it's not the same type of connection as being there, it certainly allows for a different element or, or level of connection that they didn't have. I mean, they were speak, talking on pay phones. So that's helpful. And you know, prioritizing that, that we do talk to couples about when, when either, you know, the husband or wife goes out on tour, there's that whole pregame around that the anxiety about them leaving and then they're out and then they come back and reintegrating into the home, you know, asking to take the trash out or oh, sure. you know, the natural things that, that, and potentially having some resentment about being responsible for everything while that person's out on the road and it's being perceived as it's playing yet. And a lot of that can be the case, but yet a lot of it's really stressful for the, for the artists as well that, that the mm-hmm. spouse can forget. So that's also where that communication and therapy comes into play. And thankfully now too, a lot of guys will go out with their families or, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the kids and their wives or, or husbands will come out, you know, several stops on the tour and that's helpful too, but that's certainly a challenge within the industry too. And I think with that band, you know, I tell myself it's that unhealthy lifestyle. And it's that unique lifestyle that then leads you to, to try anything that makes you feel better, whether it can mm-hmm. be a relationship, it could be the alcohol and drugs or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever the case may be, it's just anything to try to make yourself feel better. So those unhealthy coping skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And feel connected, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because you have to imagine that that search for connection sort of leads to some of these relationships that we see. I mean, William doesn't go on tour, at least not with the express intent of like meeting and connecting with Penny Lane, but it does. It's part of it, and obviously, with the band aids, we see lots of different types of relationships uh, sort of developing over the course of the movie. And we should also point out that this movie has received its fair share of criticism for some of the way that those relationships are portrayed, especially with the knowledge that we have about how the old the characters are supposed to be. And the complete lack of consent in so many places. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you for naming it, Haley. And, and yes, I'll whether it's a lack of it. consent, <laughs> yeah. but also this sort of piece of, you know, how these relationships develop and then fall apart, and then the sort of trauma, both of the non-consensual experiences, as well as, you know, things like Penny Lane's near-death overdose, right? Mm -hmm. And that's obviously, we would imagine, one of the most traumatic experiences we see in the movie, but even just losing relationships can certainly be traumatic for people as well. So, you know, the sort of trauma that can come up as a result of some of the complications of being on tour. And, you know, I was glad to hear Debbie say uh, that a lot of this stuff has gotten easier. You know, a lot of accommodations have been made to kind of support artists in managing their their relationships and the way that they want to maintain them is really good to hear. But from where we're watching in this movie, you know, 40 plus years ago, we can understand why the culture contributed to the the sorts of problems that we see over the course of the movie. Absolutely. And there was a lot of, that was somewhat just the norm. Right. We right. certainly heard about it a lot more in the past. And I also think, and again, this may be my Pollyannish view, but I, really, I don't think so, that, that people wanted more. And they said, I don't, you know, I want more than this. So, and particularly in our day and time where, people are really talking about how they want to live their lives and, and not standing on the sidelines of their lives and really taking control of that. And that more and more people are talking about emotional health and really demanding that more is done. And so that, that also I think is, has played a big part in where we are today versus where we were then, which is good news. So my hope is that we can only continue to trend up in that, in that regard as well. Yeah. And we learned through those times. I think, you know, the the sex, drugs and rock and roll time period that seemed so cool. And it seemed like mm-hmm. once I have this, I'll have it all. And then people started to realize like, oh, no, this isn't it all. And and then it led to what you're speaking to now, which is starting out recognizing it's just a piece of what I want um, and I need to make sure that those other pieces are also taken care of, the relationships, the connection, the identity, that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. So true. And that connection is key. And and, mm-hmm. after, and I'll, I'll just say, too, post-pandemic, 
for the music industry, the music industry was one of the few professions, one, you know, in addition to hospitality that was completely decimated by mm -hmm. the pandemic and then getting back out there and doing it again, mm -hmm. post pandemic, there's a lot of anxiety and angst. Um, the world's a little bit, I was going to say thicker, harder, just feels heavier mm -hmm. than it's, than it's felt in a while, at least to, from my perspective. Um, and the industry certainly feeling that. So those additional support measures are so important, particularly today, even more so post pandemic than they ever were before. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, uh, you know, I, I have to imagine like being on tour already carries, carries with it a certain amount of stressors. So now in the, I mean, still in a COVID world really where it's, you know, you have to worry about indoors, outdoors, and what are we exposing ourselves and our fans to and all these different decisions that have added complications. You know, I can only imagine the sort of, you know, hand wringing that goes on to figure out what's worth it. And but we still got to pay our bills or we still got to we still want to perform. Obviously, for a lot of musicians like that is why they do what they do is they want to be out in front of the audience and they want to be out, you know, doing these things. It's like, you know, Russell says uh, towards the end when uh, William finally gets the interview, you know, what do you love about music? And Russell says everything. I and mean, I think that that's got to be true for a lot of musicians, especially is sort of obviously there are certain musicians who, you know, are content to do their thing in their garage and, and put it out for the world. But I have to imagine so many of it, so many people is, is that connection with people and whether it's live or, or not, that that's got to be an important part of the experience. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the thrill of that. Mm hmm. You know, that's talked about a lot and there, you know, certainly that contributes to it as well. I mean, the, the accolades and the, the, all the positive things that go along with, you know, somebody who's on stage yet, then you have to get off stage and, and go live a real world. You know, of course. World, so. Well, Debbie, you may not know this, but Haley and I have both, both have performing experiences I know for me, uh, did it? I still technically do improv, but we did in person improv for, you know, uh, over a decade. And some of my members of, or some of my uh, troop members have been performing for even longer than that. But, you know, pandemic, uh, we tried doing things virtually for a little while and it was really hard. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. And, you know, we've tried to get back into theaters and not a, a lot of Main Street theaters are not really ready yet. And I think that. You know, for a lot of performers out there, whether they would be musicians or comedians or improvisers or, you know, spoken word performers of all different types, it's, you know, it's a decision people have to make about where their comfort lies and, and sort of what's worth the, the risk to the extent that it is one. Right. And Debbie, earlier you mentioned musicians can't turn it off. And I have a lot of comedian friends who always call it a disease. <laughs> They're like, it's a disease. <laughs> like, I can't. I can't control it. It's just got to be out there. Me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's really key for mm. what happened during the pandemic and where people are at now, which is this urge, this disease, this need to be doing this thing. And then the world being like, okay, but we're going to make it not quite like that, but we're going to do our best to give you the opportunity, but also not like this. And, and then on top of it, that's also how you make your money and we're going to take all that away as well. And, you know, I saw in the comedy world, just people clamoring to try to make virtual shows work and, and things like that. And, and it's hard when somebody's cooking dinner and you're trying to do stand up comedy and they, you know, their kids are yelling in the background or whatever, <laughs> you know, getting, getting heckled by someone's dog. And I think that that's a lot of this identity piece that was taken away for people is it's this this thing inside them that, that the world tries to smush, I think, in some some mm. ways with money or fame or unhealthy habits or whatever. And so really taking care of themselves so that that can be nourished instead of torn down. Yeah. And I, I mean, the grief associated with that and the loss, yeah. I mean, the, oh my gosh. the collective trauma that, mm -hmm. I mean, I even hear it from this brief exchange with you two about that experience for you both. And that's, it's huge. And it's, it's, we're, I think we've all experienced a collective grief associated with the pandemic and yeah. Yeah. 
and the residual effects of that will probably be felt for a long time to come. And those platforms that you two just discussed in terms of your public facing professions and music, I think will be a big part of the healing process for all of us. Mm -hmm. Um, That was actually a note that I took. One of my notes was um, the power of music. And it was when they were in the bus after the Topeka, Mm. Kansas party, and they were all mad at each other and Um. they were all fighting and everything. And then they started singing Tiny Dancer and all started like reconnecting with each other. And I was like, oh, the power of music. Yes. Yeah. So true. When they couldn't talk about it. Yeah, they they did. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we have this. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Yeah, the the movie ends, you know, on this note of Russell says to Penny Lane, who we now should acknowledge as Lady, uh, as much as she might not like that. <laughs> I was like, call her by her chosen name. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> you know, and he says to to Penny, you know, let's say all the things that that we haven't said to each other, all the things we wanted to say to each other, and she's like, yeah, okay, and gives him the address to, uh, you know, to William instead. And I, I really liked Russell's line when he's in this 15 year old kid's bedroom of, I think she wanted us to connect. Like we both fell in love with the same girl as inappropriate as that may be. And, you know, I think she wanted us to connect and, and they do. And, you know, Russell makes up for killing his article with the Rolling Stone. And, you know, ultimately, you know, I'm kind of brought back to the line that, uh, Lester Bang says, as he's consoling William, which is the only true currency in this bankrupt world, is what you share with someone else when you're uncool. Mm-hmm. Whatever Russell thinks of himself, you know, in that moment, in that 15-year-old bedroom, he is uncool, and it's okay for them to be uncool and, and kind of connect together. So I, I like the way it ends. You know, I, I you know, obviously all of these characters still have a lot that they need to unpack would probably very much benefit from a lot of the services that you offer Debbie. <laughs> yeah. So I, I wrote that quote down too. I love that. No. Um, and I love the way it ended. I, I think it would have been a tragedy if it had ended any other way, really, because it was certainly a happy ending and a hopeful ending. So. And in that moment, neither of them were trying to be anything other than who they were. Right. Mm -hmm. Like William wasn't trying to be this reporter on tour. He was this 15 year old in a bedroom with a recorder and was like, this is just wants to talk to someone he idolizes. Yeah. Yeah. And Russell wanted a fan and also was just a person in that moment. And in that moment, when the question is asked to what is it that you like about music? That's the first time that Russell truly lights up Yeah, in that moment where you're uncool that's when you really connect with other people, right? They weren't trying to be anything other than two people. In a well, room. that's how we know he's uncool is when he tries to flip the chair around to look cool. It's like, <laughs> is there anything, is there anything more uncool than trying to look cool on purpose? Yeah. Oh, so true. Funny. Very true. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. So Debbie, you know, uh, we like to do reviews here at the end of the show. So, you know, we like to do on a scale of zero to five somethings, both the accuracy and the entertainment value of what we're talking about. So Debbie, first I'll ask you from an entertainment perspective, let's say on a scale of zero to five funny methods of transportation, my favorite of which was Doris the tour bus. (laughs) How entertaining did you find Almost Famous? I love Doors, the tour bus. I wrote that down too. It's like, that's a perfect name for a tour bus. Yes. (laughs) I'd say five. I really enjoyed it. And I had not seen it in quite some time. And I found Mm -hmm. it very entertaining. Yeah. It was a fun movie. It was my first time seeing it. I've always wanted to. Had you not seen it originally? Mm -mm, Wow. I also really enjoyed it. I give it a four because it has not aged well. Um, mm, true. Fair. But but yeah, true, besides fair. that, I agree that it it's a very good movie. Well, Haley, I don't know if you know this. It it has 
evolved. So it became, for a brief time, a Broadway show, and Cameron Crowe did take out a lot of the more problematic aspects oh, of good. the things that we talked about today. Growth. So <laughs> I we, won't cancel We can it. give him credit for growth, <laughs> especially as, you know, he is an artist himself as a yeah. director and writer and things like that. So we can acknowledge his growth as well. But yeah, obviously some, some concerning things looking back 20 plus years later. Okay, Debbie, on a scale of zero to five incredible Jimmy Fallon's because his character in this was wild and I could not get past those glasses – how accurately do you think this movie portrayed the experience of people in the entertainment industry and their mental health and their growth and all of those things? Uh, well, if you were just going to say how um, how does it portray the industry, I would have given it a three and a half to four in terms okay. of emotional health because there were so many things that were so far fetched. Yeah, of course. Um, or over exaggerated. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the realities were captured. The emotional health that was probably portrayed a little bit. I mean, there was a little bit of an exaggeration, mm -hmm. certainly for sure, related to just how the characters were portrayed. But there were a lot of accuracies there that still apply today. So yeah. even yeah. Jimmy Fallon, I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, God. oh classic, the slick manager oh. coming in to the other guy obviously was a friend and had uh -huh. no training whatsoever. And Jimmy mm -hmm. got this, well, we're going to get on a plane. <sighs> and uh, yeah, so yeah. he was yeah. priceless in that movie. That was fun. Mm -hmm. was yeah. Great. Yeah. I, I loved it. I thought it was great, but also I, it, I agree. It seemed like some things were just exaggerated for entertainment value. Yeah. Well, the accuracy of the plane almost crash scene, I felt like ha I've never been in an almost plane crash, but I have to feel like that's exactly where your brain goes oh, yeah. is, oh my gosh, I'm about to die. I there are things I just have to say. And I, I, one of my favorite scenes of the movie had to acknowledge it. Obviously it's played for laughs, but also some brutal truths. Sometimes they, they come out one way or another in a lot of these dysfunctional dynamics, but a really interesting way to kind of have the band members confront each other. Yeah, it was great. And the confessions were flying. I mean, just yes. <laughs> there were a lot of crossovers and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. multi relationships. Yes. 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 Well, well, Debbie, we've just about reached the end of our show. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. Where can people find more information about you or, or on site if they're curious about um, learning more? Thank you so much for asking. Onsiteworkshops.com. And there's also an entertainment tab specifically for the entertainment and specialized services division. But also my contact information is there as well. So I'd encourage people to reach out. And I, this has been so much fun. So I really appreciate you all having us on. And I look forward to learning more about you too. And thank you, know, you so much. Yeah, what a blast. <laughs> yes, yeah, great. Lots of fun. Yes, well, we, we appreciate you coming on and sharing your expertise. Haley and I, I don't have guests very often, but when we have an, uh, an opportunity to have an expert with a specific perspective, we always try to take advantage of that. So thank you very much for coming on and sharing some of your experiences. And you know, for our listeners, if you have uh, certain area topics where you'd like us to bring on an, an expert or connect us with someone, we're, we're definitely happy to do so. So thank you as always, everyone, for listening. Thank you to Debbie. Thank you, Haley. And uh, hope you all check us out again next week. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.